Well, hello, it's time for another week and another assigned reading. And I will give you some remarks to help you place that reading in the context of this class and of the times. Samuel Gompertz, who is the author of a public letter, an open letter to a judge. Samuel Gompertz is the leader of the American Federation of Labor. Now, a labor union is a group that organizes people who work in a particular field, who do the same kind of job. And they bargain with the employer for all kinds of things like wages, benefits, working conditions, grievance procedures, and so forth. They speak on behalf of the workers, they represent them and they bargain collectively for a contract that lays down the payment, the rights and the duties of all the workers. So that not just you can raise wages, you can improve working conditions, but also you have the rule of law in the workplace. You become, as the individual worker, you become much less dependent on the whim, on the arbitrariness of your employer's decisions because he has made a commitment to, your employer has made a commitment to honor certain rules and he has signed a contract with you and your representative. So that's individual unions. The American Federation of Labor, like other organizations in the history of this country, is an umbrella organization that lobbies in Washington, D.C. for laws that benefit the working class as well as unions in general. For instance, the AFL would try to make sure that unions are legally protected, that they can't be fired for joining a union. They were not successful with that until the 1930s. Um, employment law essentially was at will. And if an employer wanted to fire you because you joined a union or you advocated for others to join the union, that was his business. And as a matter of fact, in the 1880s and 1890s, um, management business was able to act with impunity on firing people, on um, shutting them out from work if they joined a union, on hiring private security firms that committed acts of murder and intimidation, uh, hiring spies to live in the company towns alongside the workers to try and find out who is talking about the company, who has criticism, and to make sure that these people are let go. So it's a very repressive atmosphere. And while we already saw how the employers view their relations with labor, when we talked about Andrew Carnegie last week, who is representative for his social class, this week there's two additional actors in the same debate over the rights of workers, over wealth and income inequality, and how Americans should deal with it. The two actors are on the one hand, Samuel Gompers, who speaks for the labor movement as the president of the AFL, of the American Federation of Labor. And then there is this judge, Grosskopf. He is a representative of the state, of government. He is a federal judge, and um, he took it upon himself. And there he's not the only one who, who responds to conflict between capital and labor that way, among the judiciary, the police, and so forth. Um, he took it up on himself to convene a grand jury um, to secure an indictment against Eugene Debs. And Eugene Debs was at the time the president of the Railway Workers Union. He represented not just people who worked in railroads, but also people who manufactured railroad cars. It was an important business. And the Pullman Company, George Pullman, um, is the employer who was the subject of the initial strike that Gompers talks about here. When uh, Pullman built his factory, he created it in, in, the, in a rural area where there was nothing there and he built up the company town around it. So the people who tried to go on strike and were fired by him are the ones who, who wash up in the winter on the streets of Chicago 
And you literally have scenes of, of people uh, starving, babies dying, and so forth, because the entire workforce is simply not just kicked out of employment, but kicked out of town, since the town is owned by the company. To support the striking workers that make the railroad cars, people working for other for railroad companies proper go on a strike as well to express their solidarity. And this is the point where the railway union is indicted or is, is um, dragged in front of a grand jury for indictment by this judge with the argument that if you go on strike as a railroad worker, you are interfering with the transportation of the mail. And that is a criminal act. After all, the mail is transported by the railroads. That's the only way to get things to different places quickly. Um, so that weighs more heavily the interest of the state, of the government, in making sure the mails run on time. That weighs more heavily than whatever interest these workers might have. But as you can gather from what Gompers is saying in response um, to the grand jury proceedings, and in his letter to Groska, is that the judge also has a clear opinion as to whether workers have a point in organizing and asking for better pay, better working conditions, more rights, and more job security. Clearly, the judge thinks that this is not something workers should be doing. And already at this point, when the working class in the United States is becoming more and more foreign-born, um, especially in the newer industries, this has racial overtones. The idea that the good Americans, the white people, the old stock of Americans go to work, do their job, don't complain, and are doing well. This is not based in reality. This is essentially a fiction that people tell themselves to dismiss the labor movement. Whereas all these new immigrants, the Irish, the Germans, the Italians, and wherever else these people come from, many of whom are Catholic, they are not used to that quote-unquote manly sense of independence that allows white Americans to do their jobs and succeed in life. So they take the worst jobs and then um, imagine the chuspa, they actually ask for more. Can't they be happy to just have a job? Then they also have to go ask for more so that they can do whatever, you know, feed their families, pay their rent, all that stuff that somehow they believe they're entitled to. So Gumpers says that yes, of course, they are entitled to those things. Um, they're putting in an honest day's work. Clearly, somebody needs them to do the work, so otherwise they wouldn't be hiring them. It's not a charitable act to hire somebody. You hire somebody because um, you wouldn't be in business if that person didn't do the work for you. Um, and if you, you're going to need that person and you're living handsomely of the sale of his products, then the least you can do is also to pay him. And if you're not going to do that voluntarily, then government must level the playing field by allowing workers to organize and speak with one voice collectively rather than do what government has been doing, which is to use the full force of the courts, of the police, and especially of the National Guard uh, to actively side with the employers and to fight the workers. So, um, if Eugene Debs, the union leader who is on trial, is going to jail, if his union is broken by the courts, then clearly the state, the government intervened on the side of capital against labor. Um, now, part of this story for the history of the labor movement is that Eugene Debs, who was not that well known when this episode happened, um, becomes a bit of a celebrity as a result. And so he um, co-founds the Socialist Party in this country and runs for president multiple times on its ticket, um, most successfully in the 1912 election when he gets over 5% of the vote, but um, over 20% of the vote in wild radical places like Oklahoma, Wyoming, and South Dakota. Um, so, this is the flip side, Gumpers, Debs, etc. That's the flip side to the Carnegie and the judge. Um, and you should read it with that in mind. 
Um, so once the group gives their presentation, it's up to them where they want to put the emphasis in talking about the labor movement and talking about this case. There's a couple of remarks on the history of the labor movement, the different types of organizations that workers found to speak for themselves that you can find in the lecture slides. Um, so I hope you'll get a chance to look at those things and I'll let you get to your worksheet at this point. Um, please remember it is due Wednesday at noon and then after that it's time uh, to meet in the discussion forums and talk about this. Goodbye.